Taiwan is a fascinating experiment in terms of democratization. You know, you've got a relatively liberal uh, society. One way that people have seen that globally is that it's the first place in Asia to legalize same-sex marriage. It's an island of less than 24 million people, and yet its economy is close to one of the top 20 in the world today. But this wealthy, democratic island is not considered an independent country by Beijing. China has long viewed Taiwan as its lost territory and threatened to unify with it by force. Under Beijing's pressure, only 15 states in the world recognize Taiwan today, down from 23 in 2016. And one key country is not on that list the United States. The US is Taiwan's biggest ally, although there are no formal diplomatic relations between the two. The US is Taiwan's biggest arms supplier, has close economic ties with the island, and is likely to defend it. We are going to um, hold China accountable to follow the rules. So how has Taiwan become the most volatile issue between the world's two greatest powers? Up to the late 19th century, Taiwan, then known as Formosa, passed through the rule of Dutch and Spanish colonizers, its Aboriginal peoples, and Chinese dynasties. In 1895, the Qing dynasty of China lost Taiwan to Japan after a humiliating military defeat. Taiwan was then ruled by the Japanese for the following 50 years. Japan wanted to make Taiwan into a model colony, using it as an example to persuade other Asian nations to join the Japanese Empire. They raised living standards, uh, they improved education, they improved health, uh, and built a lot of infrastructure so that 50 years later, Taiwan was actually one of the more developed parts of the region. After World War II, uh, Taiwan was returned to the control of the Chinese government, at that point the Republic of China. The Republic of China rapidly lost the Chinese Civil War to the uh, Communist Party of China, and as a result ended up on Taiwan as a regime in exile with uh, very few resources, a lot of refugees, a very poor population struggling to survive. Taiwan relied heavily on U.S. economic aid, but by the middle of the 1960s, most of that aid was phased out as the U.S. wanted Taiwan to develop its own economy. So Taiwan changed its strategy, moving from an import substitution policy, which replaced foreign imports with homemade goods, to an export-oriented economy. And Taiwan moved very, very quickly towards uh, exporting very cheap mostly consumer goods to the United States. And as a consequence, over the next 20 to 30 years, uh, Taiwan's economy boomed. So beginning in the 1980s, the, the government in Taiwan started to think, how do we take the next step in our economic development? And they identified, among many areas, uh, semiconductors as a critical uh, technology. And so that really took off in the 1990s. Uh, with the growth of uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing uh, Company that eventually, you know, now, today, is an absolutely crucial company for uh, any company that's making uh, technology. You know, their, their chips are in smartphones, they're in tablets, they're in computers, they're in games consoles, and they're in cars as well. It's anything that you need uh, chips for, largely, you're having to come to TSMC. And so this, by extension, puts Taiwan in a fairly strong position that it is a key node in the tech supply chain globally. And so it is a really, really valuable partner for every single country in the world. Alongside this economic shift, Taiwan's political landscape also changed dramatically. Under the rule of the Chinese Nationalist Party, or KMT, for four decades, Taiwan was an authoritarian regime until the end of martial law in the late 1980s. Then Taiwan gradually transitioned to democracy. The first direct presidential elections took place in 1996, followed by several peaceful transfers of power. 
So the Democratic Progressive Party is the current party that governs Taiwan. Uh, they were a party that came out of this movement of activists pushing for more democracy in Taiwan in the 1970s. And their fundamental stance is that Taiwan is already an independent country. But this isn't the same stance held by Beijing. So from the People's Republic of China, the PRC's perspective, Taiwan remains the last piece of an unfinished civil war. It's an illegitimate regime. It's a breakaway territory that needs to be unified with the motherland. The Chiang Kai-shek regime won a reprieve in June 1950 when the Korean War broke out. The United States then stepped in to prevent a final Chinese Communist Party, uh, CCP-led invasion of the island of Taiwan. The United States has been there ever since as the guarantor of Taiwan's security. Despite this guarantee of security, in 1979, the US broke ties with the Republic of China on Taiwan and established them with the People's Republic of China in Beijing. Here things get complicated. The United States, uh, in one of our communiques with the People's Republic of China, acknowledged the PRC position that Taiwan was part of China, but the United States also did not accept the PRC claim to Taiwan. That has been our position ever since. And so in effect, the US views Taiwan's status as undetermined. But even after 1979, they have maintained informal relations with Taiwan and continue to invest here, continue to support the economy, uh, and have most importantly continued to sell arms to Taiwan. With the US in the middle, China and Taiwan have avoided war for over seven decades. But tensions between the two sides have risen in recent years. Emerging as a superpower on the world stage, China has become more assertive in its claims of sovereignty over Taiwan. While most of the Taiwanese prefer maintaining the status quo for now, many young people favor overt independence for Taiwan. The young people have really been at the heart of this political transformation we're seeing in Taiwan over the past eight, nine years, where they started pushing back against this economic integration between uh, China and Taiwan uh, that started under former President Ma ying -jeou. One of the best examples was the Sunflower Movement that broke out in March of 2014. <laughs> this movement was led mostly by college students uh, opposed to negotiations with Beijing over a free trade agreement. The movement occupied the legislative yuan, Taiwan's parliament, uh, for more than three weeks in order to block that parliament from considering this uh, trade agreement and voting on it. So in effect, the uh, Sunflower Movement protesters blocked further economic integration with mainland China. Taiwanese podcasters Kylie Wang and Ken Young joined some of the rallies and marches and started their popular news show during the movement. We have mixed feelings towards China. Yeah. Because on one hand, I know that a lot of young people want to explore the big market in China because China has just much more opportunity and sometimes even better salaries nowadays. Yeah, especially for those who just graduated from college. On the other hand, just China just keep on bullying us. We just don't like what they're doing. We want to have uh, economic growth but we do not want to sacrifice our economic growth with our freedom of speech, with our independence, with our democracy. Since the Sunflower Movement, the China-friendly KMT party has seen its polling numbers decline steeply. While the DPP leader Tsai Ing-wen won the presidential elections in 2016 and was re-elected in 2020. So she has as her bottom line effectively that Taiwan is an independent sovereign nation. Her stance is that we're willing to talk, but only as equals. And that is obviously a position that Beijing is unwilling to accept. China cut official communications with Taiwan in 2016 and stopped individual travel permits to the island in 2019. It's also upped the rhetoric on taking control of Taiwan and increased military maneuvers 
all of which is a concern for the U.S. Taiwan is by far the most likely issue to draw the United States and China into a direct military conflict. Uh, I should say I don't think the likelihood of that is particularly high still, but it overshadows all other potential points of friction in the U.S.-China relationship. If China and Taiwan did eventually go to war, there could be a devastating cost to human life and industry. Even if China manages, they could spend years rebuilding Taiwan and struggle to integrate a hostile population. So it would be an incredibly dangerous, messy affair. The attempt to invade a fortified island is always going to be an incredibly difficult one. So there's a very good reason they have not attempted to take Taiwan by military force. It's because they're not sure they can do so. And so it would be a really disastrous event for everybody involved. Uh, and there's a very good chance that other democracies in this region, certainly Japan, maybe Australia, uh, would get drawn in as well. You know, put quite simply, it's in everybody's best interest right now not to force the issue and to push it off for another few years or maybe even a few decades. But the unification would signal to the world that it's China, not the US, that's the new dominant power in the region. Being able to bring Taiwan into the PRC fold would be obviously be a huge achievement for any Chinese leader, and you know it's largely seen as being as one of his ambitions to achieve before he uh, steps down, whenever that may be. Taiwan's future really depends on if our allies would take China seriously. No, I would say it depends on the attitudes mm -hmm. of the Western countries towards China. Yeah. Because if the Western countries, for example, the US, uh, start to see Taiwan as an important geopolitical ally, then Taiwan could become a beacon of democracy in the Chinese-speaking world. Uh, if not, the Western countries would like to see China growing over the influence over the world, then they can just let China be and... Yeah, and, and we maybe. will be in real risk. Yeah, Taiwan might be in a real risk. The Trump administration showed strong support for Taiwan by providing more weapons, sending high-level officials to visit, and changing the law to make interactions between the two sides much easier. In June, a U.S. delegation visited Taipei and announced plans to donate 750,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccines to help alleviate its shortage of shots. Since Biden has taken office, the people he's put in place so far, at least, have repeated the Trump administration's position on Taiwan and have actually taken quite strong stands in favor of that approach to Taiwan, ignoring or pushing back against Beijing's objections. But obviously we'll have to see over the next four, potentially eight years, to see how strong that support for Taiwan actually is.